Infertility and Miscarriage on this edition of Truth and Love. I'm Dale Johnson, and you're listening to Truth and Love, a podcast of the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, where we seek to provide biblical solutions to the problems that people face. This week on the podcast, I have with me a good friend, Jeremy Prey. He's a pastor of biblical counseling at North Creek Church in Walnut Creek, California. He's an ACBC certified counselor, and he's in the fellow candidacy process. So in the future, he will be supervising potentially some of you who are our listeners. In addition to overseeing the biblical counseling ministry, he also oversees various other adult ministries there at North Creek. He has a Master of Divinity from the Master's Seminary. He and his wife, Haley, have been married since 2005, and they have four children. I, I want to mention, even before we get into this, Jeremy, part of the, the topic has come up. We ask you to write a booklet on this topic. I think this is an area where biblical counseling has you know, not addressed some of these issues. And so as a part of what was produced from that conversation is uh, you contributed to our biblical solutions series, our booklets. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. I'm sure I'll mention that again at the end. But I want to get right into this. This is a topic that is very tender. It's very sensitive. It's very difficult. I want you to talk talk a little bit about even your story as we weave through some of these questions and and uh, as you talk about infertility and miscarriage. So so let's let's start here. This might be an odd topic to think about as you write and speak and so on. Did you ever think you'd be writing and speaking on a topic like infertility and miscarriage? Well, thanks for having me, Dale. No, I didn't think that I'd ever be speaking or writing on this, nor did I want to, quite honestly. For my wife and I, not long after trying to conceive, we learned from the doctors that it was not impossible for us to have children, but it was unlikely, they said. And that then just launched us on into a path of building our family in a way that we never would have dreamed, ending up doing embryo adoption for several of our children that the Lord has given us now, and then having several naturally. And, and then our fourth child is a daughter, and uh, we learned after she was born that she has Down syndrome. And so there's all kinds of different things we can talk about here. But, but when it comes to the topic of infertility and miscarriage, no, I didn't want to have knowledge on that. However, now that the Lord has brought us through that, it's given me the ability to minister as a pastor in ways I wouldn't able to have been able to do otherwise. Now, I think it's important, too, when we, when we think about this topic. I mean, nobody wants to be an expert on this kind of stuff, right? And honestly, many biblical counselors w- want to do all kinds of things. This isn't a topic that they, they think they want to jump into. And sometimes I think because it's a fearful thing, maybe they've never experienced it. They don't know. They, they know it's tender. They know it's a difficult thing for people to walk through. They may not even know where to start. And so uh, how do we as biblical counselors, faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, when we know someone who's struggling with infertility and miscarriage, how do we help? I mean, how do we begin engaging? Where are the places that we start? I think one of the most helpful things to do is to just do some thinking before you actually sit down with them. In other words, you're just considering the various ways in which they might be suffering. And so, for example, you'd want to think about things from the wife's perspective and the husband's perspective, especially if one of them is the reason why they're infertile. And so how are they handling that within their marriage? But thinking about miscarriage in particular, think about how a man has the ability to move on quickly. He can put it behind him and he can act like everything's fine. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care, but women don't have that luxury because this type of struggle is happening within her body. And so if medical doctors are involved, then it's usually on her to make the appointments and to go to the appointments. And if he's working full time, it's not easy to be able to make it to all those and And so the pain and the suffering have a physical component for the wife that the husband will never experience. And so thinking through those types of things ahead of time is going to help us in numerous ways and just helps us to think deeply about what they they might be going through, which is then going to inform the tone and the questions that you ask and just to care for them well. I'd also say that you'd want to consider how this might be causing their walk with the Lord to struggle, perhaps. Put yourself in their shoes. If you couldn't have children, where would you be most vulnerable? Would you be prone to worry? Would you be jealous of others? Would you have fear of man? Would you question God and his goodness? I mean, after all, he's the one that said that we're to be fruitful and multiply, so why isn't he giving me children? Is he punish me, punishing me for that sin that I committed? And, or they're asking all those questions. 
So the goal is not to narrow down like the top five areas where they might be struggling, but instead it's just to do the opposite, to help us realize that their response could go in a number of different ways. And so when we consider things like this, we're considering the various ways in which they struggle. You begin to cultivate a spirit of compassion before you even sit down with them. And then when you actually do sit down with them, we want to ask good questions. And by that, I don't mean interrogate them. Sometimes as counselors, we hear that so often, you got to ask good questions and we don't even wait till their lips are stopped moving and we're ready to ask the next question. And so especially in a situation like this, which you mentioned is very tender, this is a time when you want to ask a question and you want to slow down and give them plenty of time to respond, to elaborate. And just remember that not every silent moment needs to be filled with words because they're going to be much more likely to really open up if they know that you seek to understand, not to be understood. Now, I can't emphasize the things that you just said enough. I I, Sometimes this is the first moment that that people have verbalized some of the pain and the hurt and the difficulty and the suffering that they're feeling, that they're experiencing. And so just as you mentioned, it's taking them a while to process it. They they thought through this story in their mind. They found themselves asking the, the very pointed questions that you even mentioned. Why is this happening? And now they're verbalizing it. So to take the, those first moments slow, to ask questions and to be patient, to, to let them sort out how they're thinking, what they're feeling, even processing that as they talk out loud to someone, even for the first time. And that brings up all the vulnerability. They've tried to deal with the suffering. They've tried to deal with the pain. They've, they've tried different solutions to try and insulate themselves, if you will. And now they're bringing all that stuff back up. And so, okay, we, we work through some questions. We get some data. We're listening. We're hearing. We're trying to do that patiently. We're trying to do that tenderly to to hear their story and to think about how, because suffering in things like infertility and miscarriage, it's it's a same experience, but people don't always experience it the same. And so it's important that we listen well on how they're handling the suffering that they're walking through, whether it be physically or whatever. And so now we 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 move into the issue of of having to give counsel. And so after we've listened, after we've heard. We've given them ample time to share their thoughts or struggles. It comes to actually begin and provide counsel. Where do we start as we, we open our mouth at that point? That's a great question. So to be clear, you're not asking what do we cover throughout our entire time with them, but where do we start? So a couple of things come to mind. First, I think that we ought to strongly resist the temptation to tell our own story if you have one. Or if you don't have one, the story of someone else that you know that's walked through a similar trial, those, that's usually where our mind goes. I want to share this to encourage them. And I would say it's, it may be appropriate to do so, but I would argue that that should come much later, if at all. I'm not saying they don't want to hear your story. They may even ask for your story. I'm just saying that I think that there's a wiser place to start right at the outset, and that's to point them to their Heavenly Father. So instead of first offering your own advice, And before mentioning helpful resources like books or sermons, I think we ought to point them to the good shepherd who cares for his sheep. So how do you do that? Two major categories come to mind. The first is to help them lament. Help them before they gather all their thoughts. Help them to bring their honest cries to God. Now, not waiting until they get all their thoughts in good order. And just by way of example, my wife and I still look back on the times that we read and we cried and we prayed through Psalm 13 during our struggle with infertility. That was some of the most memorable and pivotal phases in our trial because we just poured out our hearts to God along with David in that psalm. And then after we're doing that, asking how long, O Lord, then at that point, you kind of settle down and you're able to gather your thoughts and your emotions and come to a place where we could sing with David, literally sing out loud, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. So what that means for you as a counselor is to come prepared with some good Psalms in mind. I mentioned Psalm 13, you got Psalm 24. Psalm 77 is a great one where he counsels himself. Anyways, there's lots of other ones, but just Find a psalm that will usher their raw feelings straight into the presence of God through prayer. So come prepared for that. The second one is just to fix their hope on God. There are so many different ways that you can do this. You don't want to fix their hope on anything else but him at the outset and really your entire time together. The second thing is you want to help 
fix their hope on God. There's so many different ways that you can do this. You can remind them of John 10, where Jesus talks about how he cares for his sheep. And John 10, of course, being the the personal fulfillment of what we read in Psalm 23. So both excellent passages. You can show them how God's always at work, even when he seems idle, even while they're waiting. Ephesians 111 talks about that. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. You can remind them that God will never leave them or forsake them, even in this trial. Hebrews 12, 2, 13, 5. You can remind them that God promises to work everything for good in the lives of believers to make them more like Christ. And it's probably a passage that they already know, but they need to be reminded of that over and over again. We all do. You can teach them to hope in God because he alone is their refuge and strength. And on that point, on hoping in God, I just want to, I want to remind us to exercise some caution here. We need to strongly resist the temptation to just blurt out false hope because sometimes we don't know what to say. But regardless of the statistics, we can never promise that they're going to have a child someday, that they're going to have a child if they just stop trying. We can't tell them that their trial's almost over. We can't tell them that the pain will soon be gone. We don't know that. Placing one's hope in anything but Jesus Christ will only lead to disappointment. So to answer the question, where do we start? More simply, we could just summarize by saying, just be ready to preach the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ for sinners living in a fallen world. Everyone needs a gospel. It's central for salvation and sanctification. So give them that kind of hope right at the outset. Fix their hope on Christ. And then from that point on, in many ways, it's really just counseling like normal. So you're coming alongside the couple to help them grieve well and perhaps addressing heart issues that are revealed like fear and worry, anxiety, loneliness, and control, etc. No, that's really helpful, Jeremy. I, I appreciate even the warnings that you're giving there in our tendency when things get silent, we don't know what to say. We might start trying to put God on the hook for things he's not promised. And we have to be cautious and careful about that because we don't know what the Lord has for their life. And, and we're called to prepare them to lean into Christ no matter what their experience may, may have. And so I, I think that's brilliant advice. I want to move now to thinking about, okay, we, we always want to know practically what to do. So when we talk in practical terms, what are the kinds of things that you know, after we've done all the things you've mentioned up to this point, what do we what do we encourage them to do as a couple? Well, there's a lot that could be said here in the practical realm, but I'll try to narrow it down to several things that are specific helps for infertility and miscarriage in particular, as best I can tell. The first would be to encourage them to be good stewards of all that God's given them. So this would include her body. This would include their finances. This would include the time that they have devoted to researching this topic and going to all the doctor's appointments and so forth. So remind them to be good stewards of their body, ask them questions in that regard. You may need to exhort them to remain in fellowship. In fact, I could say you probably are going to need to exhort them to remain in fellowship and not pull back. The hard part with this particular trial, the hard part about being in fellowship is it it seems like everyone's having babies without issue. They're saying things like, I just look at my wife and she gets pregnant, and those are hard to hear. But the commands of scripture to exercise the one another's still apply. And if they're not careful, they're just going to curl in on themselves like an ingrown toenail. So you're probably going to need to equip them to exercise discernment also with medical care because it is awfully tempting to completely dismiss morality when all you want is a child. The doctors don't have the same morals. I'm assuming they're unbelievers. Many of them just want to boost their success rate. So oftentimes morality is just out the window. They'll they'll get a help you get a child at all costs. And if you're not thinking clearly, if they are not thinking clearly, then sometimes you gotta look out the rear view mirror to, to figure out how did I get here? What decisions did I make? So just help them ahead of time to exercise discernment in that area. I would say also you need to emphasize resources that they need. I, I can guarantee they're already researching resources that they want circumstantially regarding pregnancy, whether or not acupuncture is okay, whether or not I should change my diet, how should I exercise, what do I do? They're looking at all those things. Your job is to emphasize what they need spiritually. Give them what they need in relationship to the Lord. If Jesus was sitting right next to them, would he recommend a website? Would he recommend a sermon series? I have a feeling he's going to say, haven't you read? And then lastly, I'd say encourage them to sing. And I think this is important with heavy trials like this. 
remind the brothers and sisters in Christ to sing songs that feed their soul, preferably songs with lyrics that are based on or related to the Bible passages that you're studying with them. So lodge them in the context of a particular passage of scripture and find a song that takes those truths and brings them to the Lord. I don't mean find their favorite artist. I don't mean find their favorite melody. I mean, find a song that will help them to take their affections and their feelings to both the inner man and the outer man and bring them to the Lord with spiritual truths so that they can worship God with the Bible being tethered to their heart. And and so this is what Colossians 3.16 talks about, to help them to dwell, to have the word of God dwell in them richly, both in the inner man and the outer man. Yeah, well said. I love the way that you bring music into that. I think that's a way that we can continue to foster putting the word into their heart and then turning that word into to worship as we bring our sorrows and difficulties to the Lord. And that's the right posture. The, the Bible is not afraid of, of our difficulties. It's not afraid of our grief. It's not afraid of our sorrows. It's what do we do with it? Do we bring it before the Lord? And that's what you're describing there. Uh, several very good practical tips. Now I want to bring this back around to you and your wife, Haley. You and I have had conversations even about this very topic. And tell us some of the lessons that you guys have learned for for you and your wife since you've walked through this miscarriage and infertility. God really used this trial for my wife and I to help us recognize how we had a really tight grip on our plans. And if I could show you my fist, (laughs) just imagine it's a tight fist around our plans. And this, I didn't even know that I had this tight fist around my plans. We knew exactly when we were going to have kids. Two years into marriage, we're going to have kids in this month, and this is how we're going to do it. And uh, we're going to have this many kids. This is where we're going to live. This is what we're going to do. Oh, man. The Lord used this particular trial to help us not only say that we believe that God is sovereign, but to show us that (laughs) what that actually means practically. Are we really willing to yield our desires for our future plans to him and his plan? And it's one thing to say that God is control, but when his plan is different than what we were expecting, that's really where the rubber meets the road in terms of the depth depth of our faith. And we're still learning the lesson too. Uh, when things don't go our way, it's it's we're learning that it's one thing to just be okay with it. That's like the first step, but it's another thing to actually embrace it as God's good and sovereign plan. The latter takes great faith and My wife and I definitely have not arrived, and so it's a lesson that I'm continuing to learn as I get older, and especially as we started to go through the trial with having a special needs child, that all of a sudden you look at the other hand, and that hand is closed. Like, what happened here? I thought I learned this lesson, but it's just a lifelong lesson of learning to yield our plans to God's perfect plan and recognizing as such and then embracing as such and worshiping him throughout the entire trial. Well, Jeremy, listen, this has been a helpful conversation. I want to encourage our listeners to pick up Jeremy's booklet on this topic, infertility and miscarriage. He shares even in more detail some about his own story and the things that the Lord has taught him through this process. And I think it'll be an encouragement to all of you as counselors. Jeremy, thank you for this time. Thank you for having me. You're listening to Truth and Love, a podcast of ACBC. I'm so grateful for my brother Jeremy Prey and the work that their church is doing up in Walnut Creek near San Francisco and a wonderful training center there that's doing such great work in that area. I want to mention to you that Jeremy wrote a booklet for us that was released last year on this very topic, infertility and miscarriage. So many have been affected by these difficulties in their marriage, and this brother, as he talked about today has written something that's very helpful. It's a great resource that I think you all would benefit from. I also want to mention that we are releasing six new booklets at the conference this year. They will come out next week uh, during our annual conference. Uh, Six booklets that we're really excited about. Four will be in our Biblical Solutions series. And then we're starting a new series, Biblical Evaluations. And we will have two booklets that will give biblical evaluations on certain ideas or types of secular therapies that have become 
become popular so that we can help you to discern and think about some of the ideas that are propagated in the secular world. And so I want to invite you. This is our last week before we get to our annual conference and so many exciting things that are happening. You know, one of the things that we are releasing at this year's annual conference is a second edition of a book from ACBC called Sufficiency, Historic Essays on the Sufficiency of Scripture. Every single attendee at our conference, both in person and virtual, will receive a copy of this new book. I was fortunate to add a chapter to this book, and we are re-releasing it. I think you will be blessed by some of the chapters, one from Wayne Mack, one from Dr. David Pallison, one from Dr. Doug Bookman, and another from Heath Lambert. And I can't wait for this resource to be in your hands. I think you will be encouraged by it. And so uh, we look forward to this uh, being re-released and a, a new edition, a second edition that will be available for you as a helpful resource. And as always, not only with this particular resource, but so many other resources that we offer through ACBC at biblicalcounseling.com. 